meeting to order. This is the special board meeting for Sunday, September 2nd, 2018. Uh, Peter, can we have the roll, roll call, please? Sure. Uh, Smith? Absent. Epstein? Present. Rickard? Here. Thornbrook here. And O'Grady? Here. And Eric, do you have announcements? Uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody to the special board meeting. It's being live fed over the internet at campud.com. If you're online and would like to ask a question, please email echristison at campud.com, and we ask that the public identify themselves when speaking. Thank you, Eric. Okay, item four, comments from the audience. Um, anyone would like to speak on the item not on the agenda? Hi, Judy. Yes, please. Judy Flynn, KMA. <coughs> uh, first, I was passing out some data for you at this moment, and I'm going to start by just reading a bit of our findings. As you know, uh, KMA asked for the GPS data, which the district happily provided for us, and we have done some work on the data. After analyzing the GPS data provided by the KMPUD, we report the following. Number one, statistical analysis of the GPS signal distribution in the valley could not be done because raw GPS data was not provided. Number two, Cost of service per hour increased greatly last year. The cost of snow removal for homeowner associations during the 2017-2018 season was $507 per hour. This represents an increase of 144% compared to the 2016-2017 year. Also, the cost of snow removal for homeowner driveways was $902 per hour, also in 2017-2018. This is an increase of 45% compared to 2016-2017. We recommend an audit of the efficiency of snow removal department. Number three, all driveways in the valley should be treated the same way. Using the minutes spent, Driveways were charged about three times more than homeowner association roads in 2016-2017 and 78% more in 2017-2018. East Meadows driveways must be treated as a driveway, not roads in the association. East Meadow driveway data must be included in the driveway pool. Data for Kirkwood Valley driveways should also be released for analysis. Thank you. Is that? Yeah. That's what she wants to say, you. and then I have to, I'm going to. Uh, I just want to make sure, Judy, that was. I'm, I'm finished. Thank Bertrand you. will continue. We didn't want to take a whole bunch of your minutes. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Okay, so the graph, and you have it in graph A. I don't know if it is here. Uh, it shows what could be a significant bias using the GPS data of 17 and 18 years. Again, the three HOA that have individually <coughs> impacted driveways. This result is most likely due to improper GPS data allocation to respective HOA of the travel time to homeowner driveways. <coughs> so graph B, instead of the stratified layers, more or less evenly, it showed huge relative time disparities between HOA when analyzing the GPS 2017-18 year data per storm. So all snow removal events were distributed among 21 different storm beams. So we can see how each, how each HOA was actually processed per storm. Um, there are some obviously missing events of time. Here are two examples. So, for example, on November 18, 2017, after a nine-inch storm, uh, Sentinel West was plowed in one minute and 46 seconds. Another example, after a 37-inch storm on March 22nd and March 23rd, 2018, <coughs> base camp was plowed in less than an hour. So, uh, if you, I, I have in the executive summary more detail on this, and, the, and I actually proposed uh, months ago to the general manager to meet with him so I can point to him some obvious mistakes that I didn't get a response from him. Graph C, 
<coughs> I'll plot it in here, KMA versus EMA is metal. It's not because of it's specific between these two HOAs, just because they are the two biggest HOAs, so the signal is bigger, it's better to statistical analysis. So graph C shows that bias against KMA is more marked in, in low snow period. It's probably due to the what we show in the graph A as well, but also <coughs> we had a number of unexplained and accounted for idle park time in KMA polygons during the snow drought period. We asked for explanation on that, we never got it. Finally, based on the two provided GPS data here, East Meadow Minute does not include the driveway time for East Meadow. And as, as reported in the historical uh, in the historical uh, spreadsheet, um, HOA historical spreadsheet that was used for the HOA analysis spreadsheet that the general manager provided us. Therefore, all computation used for the coming year, I think, and last year was <coughs> erroneous. For last year and the coming year, the East Meadow driveway have been and are fully subsidized by the Kirkwood community. Thank you for your time. Uh, Carol. Uh, Carol and Scott Palisades, President. Um, I, didn't, I, I have not done any kind of analysis, and I just saw this just now. But I also feel in our association that there's, it's really not fair if, if we're being charged as an HOA for time spent going to driveways. And I understand some of it is not just going to driveways, but we had a huge increase. It, completely disrupted our budget. We had no way of knowing that was going to happen, particularly since the year before you decided to cap the increases. Um, so we, we definitely have a concern. Um, I, I don't have the time or the, or the knowledge to do something like this, but um, I, I'm sorry that we have disputes over this issue because I remember when the PUD started doing the plowing, we were all happy about it. and I. You know, been a customer in two associations for this entire time, and I'd like to see um, some kind of resolution that um, takes into account the association concerns. Yes, and I'll uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, anyone else? I can't make the meeting in October that you've oh, okay. scheduled. Unfortunately, I really wanted to, but I'm not able to. Okay. Frank Major, Carmore, Lot 101. Uh, the last two meetings with this GPS seems to be a big volcano going on right now. Uh, have you did any analysis at all that you could share with the community to let us kind of know what the status of it is? Have we did any test <coughs> runs? Have we did anything in the area for clarification on where we actually are on this GPS? Situation. Uh, can we respond to that, or should we? That's that your call. Um, I know that Bob has been doing a lot of analysis in preparation for October, and I know there have been test runs because I know there was one on my. I saw a notification on my driveway, so I know there have been some test runs. Other than that, I do you want to respond, Bob, at this point, or just? I mean, just to clarify that what will be presented in October. <coughs> Um, I don't or you don't have to. I mean, I don't. I don't really have anything to add. We've been working towards the October deadline. So I'll be but I think the answer, Frank, is is yes. There's been a lot of work. A lot of work has been done, and I think this will now feed into it as well. Have we did any test runs at all? I guess that's probably yeah. directed more towards the, the manager. Yes, we, we've we've done test runs and we've done analysis. So. Pardon? We're, we've done test runs and we've done analysis, and we're not done yet. And there's no results from the test runs yet. It's still in process. It's still in process. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'd be happy to present in detail this analysis at the workshop in October, so we can actually discuss looking at the data of, instead of just feeding you my result. Okay. What I would appreciate, Bertrand, is if you could coordinate with Eric on that, so there's a slot of time for that. Okay. I'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments from the audience on items not on the agenda? Yeah, I'd like to get some clarification now. We're calling this a workshop, uh, and what's the, the scheduled t time and date for that? 10-15 at, after the next board meeting. Which is on uh, Saturday? Yeah, or our normal, yeah, our normal. 
So it's on board Saturday. meeting, and then we're going to yeah. end that board meeting by 10:15 and start the workshop. Correct. Okay. Now uh, you're calling it a workshop. Is we've uh, we've never actually some, done some a workshop. Some organizations call them study sessions. It's so that it's a, it's focus on a sp one specific topic. It's less formal, hopefully, than than this. We can have conversations and um, presentations. I, I have not been involved with the organization of it, but that's what it's intended to do. It's, it's so that everybody has a voice, everybody can say what they have to say, there's less time limits, there's nothing else pending, nothing else impinging on the schedule. So that's the, that's the nature of it. Okay, and in the public, <coughs> the public, we can't make any decisions, right. technically. We won't be so making any we're decisions, right. but we're trying to... It's it, What it is, it's, it's information gathering, discussion, hashing things out, a kind of a conversation. But because the board's there, Peter, it has to be a publicly noticed meeting since the whole board will be there. Right, that's what my concern is that we follow the right protocol because it's, a, it's something yeah. new I don't think we've yeah, ever done. Yeah, we're noticing it yeah. just like we would any I just other don't want to have any potential violations of the Brown no. Act. Oh, no, it's, no, it's being noticed just okay. like a regular okay. meeting. So that takes away that issue. We right. did it a couple of years ago on um, utility. Yeah. <laughs> we called it a workshop? I we think so. Study session. Study session. Study session. Oh, okay. It was in terms of our priorities. It was December of one year or another. Uh, <coughs> and the staff is going to gather as much data as they can on this? Yeah, we're, we're pulling it yes. together. I, I would like to see some kind of a historical timeline from uh, when we actually started doing snow removal. I can't remember what year that was. And, uh, you know, w when the different associations came on board. Oh, about 03, I think. You think it was what? Around 03. Around 03? Yeah. I was living in the Meadows. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't recall. I remember the first contracts with my I just, so we get some perspective. And I, I'd like to see a, a timeline of what we've spent in terms of equipment and the, the building when we built it, how much it cost. <laughs> I, I know it's the building has a multi purpose to it. I mean, it's not just for snow removal, but predominantly it is. So obviously we've committed funds uh, over the years, and I'd like to get some kind of sense of that. Uh, and also, I think it would be appropriate at this time for to get some kind of a review from Dick Shanahan on how we set the rates to make sure that, because this is kind of, we have a lot of restrictions on how we set rates with regards to water and all the other services, but this is like a, we have these private contracts, and I, I just, in retrospect, I'm not sure that we're following every regulation that we as a special district are required to, to follow. And I, I think it's a good time to review that process from, from Dick Shannon, if, that, yeah. you know, just... Cross the T's, dot the I's, and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, we already have that in the presentation, Peter. Okay, okay, good, good. Nick. Yeah, this, this isn't a utility service. This is specifically excluded. It's not a utility service, so we're not subject to anything relative to that. But I'll have that from Dick on there. Yeah, just mm -hmm. I just feel uh, better. So we, we can resolve this and know that we're making right. no, I understand. decisions based on, on our legal abilities. That's all I wanted to comment Thank you, on. Thank you, Peter. Keep going your frame. Peter. <laughs> I know you're Peter. <laughs> um, any other comments from the audience? Judy? Just looking ahead to the study session on October 13th, from the standpoint of the HOAs, we will expect to see a set of, I don't know if you want to call them rules or determining factors, a, a list of how you're going to determine our contract price for next year, the following year. Uh, we can have this study session, and that's all well and good. But if we don't develop a step-by-step -step procedure for setting the cost of snow removal for the HOAs, it's a worthless session. <coughs> okay, I mean, I, I would just say that hopefully out of this session would come the points of view and information necessary to set up those steps. I mean, that's the whole point, is to get people's perspectives on it and how we should go about doing it. Okay, uh, they're trying. I comment on a different topic. It's related to the KMPUD uh, survey. And uh, I happened to be crossing the Atlantic during the small period of time that was uh, allowed to 
computer. So when I, I came back to 10 of August, so I tried to log again and I could not, it, told, it was basically closed. So I could not put in a survey, respond to the survey. I think it's a bit short. I mean, we do have lives other, other elsewhere and uh, I think maybe that period should have been extended a bit. I noticed actually some people in the, in the packet that there are some people ex that survey had been accepted on August 27, which I don't understand since it was closed on August 10, but... Uh, uh, yeah. okay. okay, I found Meadows' analysis <laughs> by the district of the 04 or 05 season explaining changes. So I think 04, 05 was most likely the first, I have the data right here, the first year, which is what I remember. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the audience? Okay, if not, we will move on to uh, corrections to the agenda or consent calendar. Eric or board members, any corrections to the agenda or consent calendar? And my name. Seeing none, we will move to the adoption of the consent calendar. Uh, there, uh, this is comprised of three items. Approve regular board meeting minutes for August 11th, 2018. Approve current consent for claims re and review receivables and shutoffs report. Do I have a motion for adoption of the consent calendar? So moved. I'll second it. Peter moves and Standish seconds. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That's <coughs> adopted. Okay, we go to items now for board action. Uh, a is finances, discussion, and possible action regarding the district's financials. Welcome, Kelly. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> uh, we'll start with the uh, consolidated balance sheet on page 23 of your packet. Um, the only note on the balance sheet. Uh, was uh, the operating cash was down from plan, um, and this was just due to the timing of the Bank of the West loan refinance. I had budgeted it uh, for us to receive that money in July, and obviously <coughs> there's been a delay in that refinance, so uh, we haven't uh, received that yet. Um, other than that, uh, nothing uh, out of the ordinary to report on the balance sheet, um, unless there are any questions. Well, jumping ahead, way ahead to the cash flow statement, it looked to me like you modeled it without Bank of the West loan receipts. Is that correct? No, no, okay. it's in there. Let's talk about that then. Okay, it's, it's it. under September is where I moved it to, where I moved that $411,000 to. And the, the cash flow that's in there is just from the, uh, is the same one from last month. Uh, I haven't. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on then to the combined income statement on page 25. Uh, revenues for July were up from plan by $35,000. You can see in both commercial and <coughs> residential um, as compared to budget. Um, total operating is up from plan by $87,000. Um, and this has a lot to do with when we budgeted for certain uh, large projects to, to be done or to have received invoices. Um, we haven't received some, so it's more of a timing thing with, uh, with audit, um, uh, the bills we get for audit and uh, some of the big projects that we had. So we had scheduled them in July. They just they haven't happened yet or haven't been completed yet. So it's a timing thing mostly there. Um, Moving on to uh, water on page 29. Uh, operating revenues were up from plan by $1,700. Uh, total operating for water is up from plan by $6,400. Um, still operating at a loss, but just not as much of a loss as we had budgeted for. Moving on to wastewater on page 30. Uh, revenues are up from plan by $7,400. Um, total operating is up from plan by $1,700. Um, and again, you can see, um, you know, the savings and operations and maintenance. It, it, 
it again it's just a timing thing i don't expect that to to stay that way the 17,000 yeah. right uh, yeah, the 17000 is the uh, what we're up from plan. But again, still operating at a loss, just not as big of a loss as we had expected. Uh, we'll move on to electric on page 32. Um, I did want to note the negative balance in other revenues is due to the reversal of penalties on uh, the uh, Vail account. Um, uh, they hadn't paid the... Uh, the back payment on chair 11 um, and uh, we did get that payment in and we reversed the penalties for them so uh, that's why that's showing a negative there but revenues for uh, July are up from plan by $21,000 and uh, year-to-date total operating in electric is up from plan by $39,000 um, and again uh, you can see operations and maintenance their um, timing of uh, some projects that we had scheduled to be done in, in July that we haven't received yet. Uh, we'll move on to snow removal on page 34. Um, and you'll notice the large overage in wages and benefits uh, in snow removal. We didn't budget any, uh, any time there for July. Um, obviously, with all the work that we've been doing on uh, the snow removal contracts and all of those things, um, we have a large overage in uh, wages and benefits. And that is noted on our uh, budget variance tracking as well. Um, moving on to propane on page 35. Uh, operating revenues are up from plan by $5,300. Um, total operating is up from plan by $18,000. Um, and again, you'll see that under uh, operations and maintenance, um, the uh, savings are not savings, but the uh, variance from budget of $11,000. It was due to the propane leak survey. We had that budgeted to happen in July, and uh, it just uh, happened in August, right? So we'll see that come through in August. <laughs> that is all I have on. Uh, income statements unless there are any questions okay uh, hearing none um, moving on to the uh, balance sheet comparison July 17 to 18 um, I, I didn't have any specific notes on there um, but you can see that uh, as far as total operating cash goes we are up in operating cash as well as reserve um, and again uh, the reserve being over from last year is due to us putting money aside that we're going to have to pay to PG&E. So. But we're significantly down in the cushion of credit. Right. Which offsets, mm -hmm. partially offsets that. Correct. And our income statement comparison, um, you can see uh, commercial and residential revenues are both up from last year. Um, and uh, operating expenses are right about the same from last year to this year. Uh, July EBITDA, uh, you'll notice that uh, we are at $91,000 uh, up from plan for, for July. And it's, it's the same in July and year to date, obviously, because we only have one month of uh, anything to report. So um, a good way to start, start the year. Hopefully, we'll keep going that way, and we'll have a good winter. Yes, knock on wood. Uh, so uh, moving on to the cash waterfall. Um, again, this is the same exact one from, from last month. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, – we haven't done any August billing yet. We haven't, uh, haven't got to that yet. Um, we were having an audit for the last two weeks. So, uh, And with the timing of the early – board meeting. We just haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, but you'll notice uh, Standish again in September of 18, that other income, that's the Bank of the West uh, refinance, when I hopefully will uh, will be coming through this month. Um, so at some point during this meeting, are you going to cover where we are with the Bank of the West loan and the rest of them? Yes. Okay. And this shows that we're, you know, factoring in all the PG&E stuff, we're still at about Two million dollars at our December seasonal low. Right, but just nothing That's in reserve. Good. That that this, right. the 
the part that makes me nervous is sure. not having any reserve at that point. But as far as operating cash goes, I mean, we will still have the line of credit that if anything were to happen, we do have that $400,000 with Bank of the West uh, line of credit. If, if we needed to dip into that, we could. Um, and then uh, moving on to known budget variances, the only, um, oh, I'm sorry. This was last year's known budget variances. I didn't update. <coughs> There's only, uh, for this current fiscal year, um, the only thing that's on the budget variances is the snow removal wages and benefits at $8,851 total. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the audience? Board members? Thank you, as always. Okay. Um, Sorry, are you going to comment on the status of the audit? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, it went very smoothly. Um, I, we didn't have any um, uh, adjustments to make. There was a couple of reclassing of some uh, expenses, and um, uh, one of our uh, the project that we have going for Peddler Hill, they wanted me to move that from um, a, a work in progress account to a deposit account. Because that's basically what it is. There, you know, any work we're doing is going against that deposit we got from Cal from Caltrans. So, um, but uh, Eric talked to them, and uh, I was really smooth. I, I was very happy. The only thing I asked them to do additional was to look at how we treat our um, fire fund reserve because that question's been raised numerous times. So they're going to be looking at that and confirming that we're doing everything good, or they'll give us recommendations of changes. That's great. Uh, so, yeah. I'm glad you asked him to look at that. Other than that, um, very smooth. It yeah. was uh, they not... They finished, what, two days early over what they had budget? They were here supposed to be here no, till they, Friday and they left Wednesday afternoon? They were only supposed to be here till Wednesday. Oh. I had it in my head they were going oh. to be here till Friday. <laughs> but, no, they, they were they were here for their scheduled time and um, no surprises. It was, it was good. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll move on to 8B, which is the 2018 customer survey results <coughs> discussion. Jesse? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, the customer survey. So the customer survey was first distributed on July 17th, um, and then we sent a reminder out on August 2nd, and it was distributed via email on the, on the district's report server and um, the postal service. Um, people got paper surveys. Um, then it closed on August 11th. Um, that gave customers just over four weeks to respond. Um, there were a total of 128 responses out of 756 customers. Um, and so I just wanted to give you some highlights of the survey and compare it a little bit with the 2016 survey. Um, but just a note, the 2016 survey, um, there was a change in the method of distributing the collected, uh, distributing collecting surveys and responses. Um, the 2016 survey was sent to every customer. The 2018 survey was just sent to every account. And in 2016, the surveys were not tracked as to which account they were coming from or how many surveys we were receiving back. Um, in 2018, we tracked to make sure we were just receiving one survey from each account, which could have an unquantifiable effect on the comparison of both years. So, so what that means is that, let's say there's a, a husband and a wife on one account if both uh, did the survey, what would happen? If they both, if I received a survey that from an, an, an identical address, then I deleted one of them. Um, I yes. It was noted. It was noted in in the survey that know. yeah. I'm a little unclear because I have five. I have three accounts and five properties. Did you? Include me as one or as three or as five. I, I sent you a survey to each of your right. accounts. Yes. So you could have so, responded and I for each. I returned them, and so you didn't delete me as the other. Absolutely. Okay. Where we say 756 customers at 756 accounts. Just, Correct. Just, just to be precise. Yes. And we expect one survey per account. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks. 
services for the Kirkwood community and meeting your expectations. You can see from 26 to 18, there really wasn't much change. Um, there was, uh, can I see my notes? So, um, so our overall rating held fairly steady. There was just slight fluctuations in either direction. And I, I found that to be true across the survey, that there wasn't much fluctuation, just slight in either direction. All right, so overall, how helpful do you find the district's customer survey staff? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> customer service staff, thanks. To, I'm in customer survey mode. <laughs> um, so you can see there was, it held steady, just a slight increase from 94% in 2016 to 96% in 2018, finding the customer service staff helpful to extremely helpful. Um, so that was nice, being one of the customer service staff. And survey staff. And survey staff. <laughs> so on your most recent contact with your customer service staff, how satisfied were you with the outcome? So the latest survey shows satisfaction with customer service contact and outcomes has a slight increase from 89% in 2016 to 94% in 2018, being satisfied to extremely satisfied. Um, the district provides its customers the ability to remotely and securely monitor your ongoing water, propane, and electrical usage from KMPUD.com once you've registered your property on the website. Have you found this valuable for you and your Kirkwood home? So in the most recent survey, we added the option to select that they were not aware that the survey exists. And I was struck by this, that 34% of the respondents were not aware that they could monitor their utility usage. Um, and customers that do use the service generally find the service valuable with little change from 2016. So that said to me, we need to do more um, promotion of the, um, the, the, the customers can monitor there. And we get that a lot answering the phone. We, we get, you know, confusion about that and then we direct people to the website and people are very happy to, to find that they can monitor their, their usage. All right, so the next one. And these, okay, so these next questions were questions that were added that were not on the 2016 survey. So these are new to 2018. Um, the district provides its customers the ability to sign up for emergency notifications via phone call, text, or email for issues related to KMPUD services. Have you signed up to receive emergency notifications? 65% of the respondents have not signed up to receive emergency notifications. Oh, sorry, have signed up. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> they have signed up. So, so that's, that's really good um, that people are being engaged and wanting to know what's going on out there, but we still need work, we still have work to do getting the rest of these folks to sign up. Excuse me, if we prepare a, a, an introduction to the PD and the there's this sale, mm -hmm. do we mention the emergency services in there? The ability... Yeah, we mentioned the online sign up. I don't know if we mentioned, we'll have, we'll have to look at that. Because yeah. right now there's a Pretty big, significant turnover in sure. homeownership that I'm yeah. We'll make sure we add that if okay. it's not in there. Okay. I believe it is in there. It's part of the registration on the website. When you when you go to your profile, you know, if you register your account on the website, that's where you sign up for the emergency service notification. Okay. So as part of you registering your property is where you can sign up for emergency notifications. When we do have new owners, Kathy Byer sends out a really comprehensive package to to homeowners, giving them all sorts of information about right, the Right, I was just wondering if that was in that package. I believe it is, but I'd have to double okay. check. All right, so the next one. How can you check if you are still on the list? Because I know I did it a long many years ago. If you're still on? There are several systems, so how, if I want to check if I'm on the list, what do I do? So go to your, your I believe you're registered on kmpd.com. Yeah. KMPD go to your account and then check your profile, click on okay. your profile, and then scroll all the way down to the bottom okay. and you can see what you're signed up for and you can check yep. certain things and uncheck things. Yeah. All right, so the next one. 
Um, did I? That's okay. Oh, let me go back. Okay. Thinking about the emergency notification services above, would it be valuable for the district to add notifications when available about Caltrans patch closers, accidents, and constructions, construction on Highway 88? The majority of respondents would value this service. There wasn't really, there was 11 people that said it would be somewhat valuable. Most people, I think, would really like this. I, I, Can I just ask a quick question of the few members of the public who are here? Do you participate in the next door service? Yeah. No? I can't participate because I participate in NAPA. They have this funny little rule where oh, you sorry. can't be in two at the same time. Oh, I'm in if you get a different uh, email address, email. you can. If you get a second email address. Oh, I guess I could do that. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I just spoke with someone yesterday and they didn't realize it. All they had to do is get another email address, so we'll probably have some more people getting into the Kirkwood community. But that's that's how I do both. I have one email address for home and one for here, one for Jackson. Thanks. All right, so this, um, I couldn't fit 2016 and 18 on the same slide. So this is the 2016 survey of folks evaluating the district's performance in um, providing services. So I'll let you guys look at that for a second. And then there's 2018. And so comparing the evaluation of the district's performances, um, the ratings improved slightly in each department with the exception of water wastewater that had a 12% decrease for reasons that we probably all know. <laughs> and then um, do you have a private driveway snow removal contract? 76% um, said no, so the majority of the people responded um, just have their HOAs. And then if yes, what is your overall satisfaction with the snow removal service? 83% um, of customers with private driveway contracts are satisfied to extremely satisfied with the service. And you can see the um, small percentage of the people that were just somewhat satisfied or not at all satisfied. So what is your overall satisfaction with snow removal service for your homeowners association? 83% of respondents are satisfied to extremely satisfied with their HOA service. And again, you can see the small percentage of folks that aren't. Um, so thinking about your snow removal services, do you utilize the online service to request and receive notifications when snow is plowed, and how do you rate it? 72% of respondents are unaware of the service or have not signed up to receive notifications. Um, but the few that are seem to be satisfied. Okay, regarding snow removal services, do you believe the district rates are reasonable, extremely reasonable, very reasonable, somewhat reasonable, or just reasonable? 75% of the respondents believe the district rates for snow removal are reasonable to extremely reasonable. And again, you can see the other um, small percentages of not so reasonable. Um, what is the likelihood that you would attend regular district board of director meetings if the meetings were changed to take place on the second Friday evening of each month? 22% um, of respondents are likely to extremely likely to attend board meetings if they were changed to uh, the second Friday of each month. 78% of respondents are not likely to attend. And I found that sort of across the board that we kind of have our key people that attend and most people just aren't here or they're skiing. <laughs> Um, so what is the likelihood that you would attend the regular district board of director meetings if the meetings continued on the current schedule of the second Saturday morning of each month? 18% of the respondents are likely to extremely likely. 82% um, are not likely to attend. Oops, and then that was it. And Bertrand, I wanted to address uh, your um, concern about the, the August 27th. Um, yes. surveys that were entered. Those were paper surveys that I received by the deadline that I just okay. hadn't had time to get in there until that date. So I took off July 14 and I come back August 10. Oh, so you were gone during the yeah. whole... Yeah. So I just was out of it. Not online for a month. That's pretty good. Hey, as I said, some people have a life. Congratulations. So that was all I had on the Survey. Listen, anybody has any questions, <clears throat> comments? Um, 
<clears throat> I have a few. So, first of all, if two customers are extremely dissatisfied, I don't consider that statistically insignificant. Uh, so I think where we can, we want to go back where the dissatisfaction was and figure out whether there's a way to satisfy. <laughs> or, you know, but, um, so that, that's one point. And a lot of those are correlated with specific responses uh, in, in the text. Uh, the other thing we talked about in the IT committee, which I think is relevant here, is we default. Um, so someone has to register, which means they need a valid email address that we that we cross cross verify. Uh, but then uh, it defaults to no information, and uh, most people would know that the defaults is what tends to happen. So if we just default to, you get all this stuff unless you uncheck it. I think that would increase. That's one way. To, that's the one way to increase the rate of new signups. Uh, also, the way the website is written, you have to scroll down to find it all. So, call it below the fold and newspaper talk. And so, changing those, changing the design there, might help. But most of the signups would come from existing customers that are unaware that need to be, you know, notified and given the and reminded of the opportunity. We also were going to add some newsletter articles specific to some of the questions that came out of the customer survey to that. Also, we discussed that at the IT committee. Right. Right. I mean, because things like people said, well, when are you going to fix the potholes in Kirkwood Meadows Drive? Yeah. And we could say never. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> it's just people make assumptions about what we're responsible for, what we're not. And that there was a fair number of questions that fell into that category. I did do an article uh, for this month on recycling, which there were several comments about <coughs> how the heck does recycling work. And so I just reminded and reiterated again how recycling works. Right. Um, any other comments from board or audience on the survey? I, I would say that it sounds like basically PUD is doing a good job. I mean, it seems positive to me in general. Yeah, overall, I think it is it is positive, but we have these these areas. I mean, which we are hearing about. Where, I mean, it, what's kind of uh, interesting is that two years ago, when the snow removal, that was the level of least satisfaction, even though it was decent, and that's what led to some of the things that people are concerned about now. So we, I think we're going to have to address that, and and. Uh, uh, as well as understanding right. the other the other items as well. One of the goals in the customer satisfaction from two years ago was a lot of that was someone would call and make a request and they had no idea whether it got followed up or not and we didn't have any tracking. So tracking all of that and being able to automate the notification, one of the primary goals of that was to keep people informed. And we, so. Yeah. Okay, well, I think, uh, so what happens from here then with this? Um, we, we have this information. We know that there will be some more information going out to people. Mm -hmm. um, should each of the committees then look this over and see if there's anything within their realm that they should be addressing? Uh, what, what actions do we take after this, I guess, is what yeah, I mean. Yeah, basically the, the, the next steps are the articles to educate where there's clearly a mis you know, misunderstanding of what we do and what we don't do. Um, where there are specific questions from identifiable respondents, we'll be responding to those. Um, but I don't know. Well, what on the, on we the wastewater, where Jesse said we think we all know the, the answers to that, do you mean that that was because we had to um, ask people to? Minimize use on a couple of occasions because I, of the overflows. Those are some of the comments yeah, specific to that. Okay, so we know we know we need to do work on that, which we are doing work, work on that. We understand the snow removal <coughs> issues, particularly it's the contract and whether or not we're doing too much or too little and so on. We understand that we've got to go through that in October. Uh, and we all know the electric rates are high. We would love to bring well, them down. I wouldn't down. single out electricity with that statement. <laughs> say every utility is expensive. Well, but Kirkland. I don't know that the water and wastewater is that much different than what I pay in Menlo Park, to be honest. I've looked at that. And well, propane is certainly no no more than what you do in PG&E natural gas. I mean, it just follows the market. So, you know, I think the big deal is, in my view, is, is electricity. 
and, and we and we've got to deal with aging infrastructure, and we're going to have to pay for aging infrastructure. The somehow, comment, the comments on electricity was that the rates were too high, that it was expensive, but people were happy with the service. People were happy with um, the power not going out. Um, people seemed very happy. Their with clocks the read the right time. It, right? Exactly. Yeah, they don't have to yeah, reset appliances and yeah. whatnot. I, um, I just think uh, that one of the differences is, and there, there's at least one customer comment. It's two hundred dollars a month if you don't come to your house, yeah. and and that's because of the fixed costs that we have, whether someone uses yeah, utility true. or not. That uh, the per cubic foot rate for water and propane is reasonable, but the fixed costs yeah. spread across such a small community yeah. is is where it's is where it's really expensive. I would like to see an article about that. I mean, I understand it because I come to these meetings. And I'm one of the ones that said I thought the bill was confusing because I'm, I've got tenants, long-term tenants, and I'm trying to bill them back. And then they move out halfway through the month, and they don't understand that the base rate is so high that I have to bill them, and I also have to figure it out. So I, I am a little frustrated with the whole base rate thing and how to explain it to someone else and how to calculate when someone moves in or out. Not on the first. Um, we did. I did do articles on that in the annual report to try to try to explain it. But we can do it. I mean, it, it's worth repeating. I I agree with you that it's. Yeah, I think it's we have, an issue. I think we have a wealth of fodder for newsletter articles for the next umpteen yeah. years. <laughs> and I think for that's sure. And that and read. that was actually yeah. one I was already working on relative to wastewater specifically, but explaining how much pipe we have in the ground for how few customers we have and comparing us to a city with the same amount of pipe in the ground and with ten times the customers now you understand right. it as an yeah. explanation. But a tenant doesn't understand it. Sure. Oh, <clears throat> right. I'm like, well, if you use nothing, it's this it's much. Expensive. Right. It's expensive. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's cheaper if you use a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so just a few points. Uh, sending an email to people that uh, they cannot come is not going to generate good sentiment, but I know what happened and hopefully we won't have this situation again. But clearly that was probably what happened here. Um, sewer base fee is very high. Uh, I don't know, I, and it may actually go higher because we still have to do more work on it. So this is, to me, the one which is the most <coughs> out of line compared to what I have in the valley. And the third point I wanted to make was, um, where say that? Um, well, I'm going to skip it, yes. <laughs> well, if you think of it later. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I will respond to that, not disagreeing with you. Yeah. But we lose half a million dollars a year in our sewer plan. Yeah. And the infrastructure is really bad. I'm just saying as a feedback, okay. the people who are getting the bill for the sewer fees is, is usually a shocking fee. The reason why we pay so much is because we're at the top of the water thing and we need to clean the water we release. So. I don't I understand why it is. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying sure. this is what is the most striking sure. one. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anything else on customer service? Yeah. Thank you. That was very nicely done. Thank you. We'll go on to item 8C, the Volunteer Firefighter Assistance Grant. Uh, Rick. Good morning. Hi, Rick. Good morning. So, we were fortunate enough to receive the uh, Department of Forestry Fire Protection 50 uh, 50 grant this year. We've received this grant in the past, and it's really associated to um, the protection of firefighters and the personal protective equipment of firefighters. Um, I did ask for uh, this year for two sets of turnouts for Wildman, and this picture here on the Presentation kind of shows what I was looking to, to, to purchase. Basically, it's blouses, pants, boots, helmets, uh, more importantly, fire shelters, and training fire shelters so we can provide proper training for our staff. Um, and Why only two? Just because that's all that it would cover? Or? Um, one, to keep the cost down, but two, I do have a reserve of equipment now, but um, I'm trying to slowly build up an inventory so I can fit all the different sizes of volunteers I have. 
So I do have some existing gear that uh, is old uh, U.S. Forest Service gear, as well as borrowed gear from Eastern Alpine County. And in the last several years, we've been slowly building this inventory up. Um, so this year, uh, we did receive an award uh, for uh, grand total was $3,300. The district's responsibility after we pay and be reimbursed uh, would be about $1,665. So before you on page 91 is a resolution, 1809, uh, respectfully requesting the board to approve this resolution to purchase uh, wildland firefighting protective equipment for the volunteer fire department, uh, which would be through the uh, Again, the Department of Forestry, let me get this right. It is the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection Agreement number 7F18057 for the Volunteer Fire Assistance Program and the Cooperative Forestry Assistance Act of 1978. And I open up to any questions. Okay, thanks. Any questions or comments from the board or audience? So moved. So you move, move approval of resolution number 1809s. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations for another grant. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll model it once we receive it. <coughs> okay, with that, we move on to item 8D, which, uh, yeah, 8D, propane bulk tank internal valves. Well, Brandy. on our uh, plan to replace the internal valves on one of our bulk propane tanks. Uh, we did go back to uh, Kiva Propane Construction Company uh, to get the additional quote for valves and work necessary to isolate and operate each tank independently. Uh, that's in your packet. It came out to about an additional $15,500. Um, bringing the total of the project uh, to $55,500, which was below um, the board allocation that we received last time. Uh, we have ordered parts for this and scheduled work to start September 10th, um, and we should see work completed within an approximate one to two week period. So we are on for this project and excited about getting it done. So you're pretty confident that going into this winter we're the propane, yes. the propane system. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be in much better shape. Yes. This is just a report, right, for yes, information? Mm -hmm. So, Brandon, just one quick question. So we don't expect to have to dis discontinue service during that two-week period because it will depend on the other tank. Exactly. We'll be moving all of the product to one tank, running off of that tank right. while we do the work. So okay. uh, we should not experience any interruptions. So if we ever did have to turn off propane service and the procedure for relighting, do we know which houses actually have pilot lights that would require relighting as opposed to ones that would be automatic? Or? From a safety standpoint, we have to assume that they are all manual relights um, because we, we don't have a list and customers, if they are simply replacing an appliance, often don't tell us. Um, so from a safety standpoint, we leave propane off until someone is available to provide access for relighting or checking. So that means we go through and remove, uh, take all the curb stops and turn them off? Or how do we... How do we Curb stops or um, at each meter, there's a shutoff valve oh, there see. that's lockable. So uh, whichever one is easier to get to. Okay. okay. Or no. Or if it exists, there are no curb stops. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. That's great. I guess that leads into the next agenda item. which is 8E, propane leak survey results. Randy. Uh, we are required, uh, we are regulated by the CPUC's propane safety division. Um, and this division requires that every five years we have a leak survey done of our distribution system. So that's everything from the piping at the tanks out to each person or account's individual meter. We were due for that this year. We had that done, um, and we, uh, we had it done August 13th through 17th, um, and we came back with 
a list of leaks. Um, I've included in your packet the list of leaks with all the customer data um, taken out. Uh, so it's just a list of approximate locations and how many of each. Um, but basically there's three types of leaks that you can have on a propane system. A grade one leak is an immediate hazardous leak that's going to cause problems. Um, we did not have any of these leaks found on our system. Uh, slightly less than that is the grade two leak, which is it's recognized as being non-hazardous, but it is a large enough leak that um, it justifies scheduled repair. And we actually found 36 of these leaks on our system, um, all on the above ground portion of the pipe leading from our underground system to someone's house at the meter set area. Uh, and then the grade three leaks are non-hazardous when we found them. They're small enough that they can reasonably be expected to remain that way. Um, and we have to address these by either repairing them or re-inspecting them within a one-year period. And we found 46 of these in exactly the same locations on the above ground portion of the pipe between um, our underground system and uh, the house, so at the meter set assembly. Um, so we have a lot of work on our hands for the next couple months. Um, we've started an aggressive repair program starting with the grade two residential leaks. Um, those because they must be repaired within six months and it is difficult at times for us to get access to relight these houses. So we have started these, we are doing two a day, um, which is about as much as we can reasonably get done, um, scheduling them, letting the homeowners know that they're happening, and recommending that uh, someone give us access before it starts to get cold. Um, so once we get the grade twos done, which I expect to happen probably the last week in September, um, we'll move on to the grade two commercial leaks. Uh, once those are done, we will start in on the grade threes. Um, so I just wanted to let the board know that we have done this required study, um, we have the results, and we are working on repairs. Is there, a, is there a, some sort of a pattern about why the leaks are happening where they're happening? Is it just a matter of things loosening up, or is it tightening? What, what's, um, what's I, I think I think that the uh, that they were all found above ground is. Um, is significant in saying that our underground system is very, it's all welded plastic pipe underground. We don't see as many problems there. The above ground portion of the system at meter sets is, um, is metal threaded pipe that you um, set that is exposed to the cold temperatures, the warm temperatures, um, snow impacts at times. Um, so that it, it's reasonable that we see the leaks there. And this is not unusual. This is about where we were five years ago when we had the last survey done. Um, so it's just a matter of wear and tear on the system in our environment above ground. I would also add we're, we're replacing meters. We try to do 10% a year. So we're tying this, uh, these repairs in with replace, meter replacements where the meters are older. So we're trying to kill two birds with one stone not have multiple shutoffs of propane as well. Yes. Thank you. In the packet in the, in the, uh, the leak survey results, what is that column that's reading with the percentages? What does um, that mean? That is the percent, uh, that's the reading that our survey company got uh, at the leak. So it's either a percent of um, atmospheric air right at the leak site or a PPM reading. Um, so the grade twos, uh, were the percentages, and the grade threes were at a, a lower PPM. So what would a grade one be? What's the threshold between two? You know, and I one? I don't know that, but I can certainly find out for you. Eric. Well, I'm, well, I'm just curious because I see this one at 42 percent, mm -hmm. and then drops down to 10 percent. I'm just curious. I, I will find out for you. That's a good question. And this is all up right? So no, we're not studying any leaks beyond the meter. No, we're seeing some, we see leaks beyond the meter and we notify the homeowner in those cases um, to make those repairs downstream side. Right. We're, we're only fixing How far are we things. going? Are we going up to where the pipe goes in the house? Uh, that is where this leak survey stops, so there are some there. Most of these are, most of the piping connections are either right at the meter or within, 
you know, six inches from there. So if it's in the bubble of our responsibility of the meter set, we're repairing them. Otherwise, we're letting the homeowners know. Yeah. So Ben, I had a couple of questions. So I, I follow these guys around since I was here at the same time, and my neighbor's house is one of the grade twos. So he mentioned that when he just puts the meter in the ground in Kirkwood, mm -hmm. that he gets readings. And I'm wondering if, and all it's doing is, is, is detecting a hydrogen, it's detecting a molecule. I don't know which molecule it is. So what was, what was the cause of the background? noise from the ground. And I, I'm not sure on that, Bob. Uh, he reported the same thing to us. He was yeah. getting very low-level reads anytime he opened up any meter or yeah. any every vault can. Amount, every vault. Um, and he is using, or he was using new equipment uh, this year as opposed to five years ago because we did not have any of those background reads five years ago. Okay. But uh, he didn't have, at least when he left last time I talked to him, a solid theory on what it was in the ground that was causing this because he he got the same read at a water valve right. than he did at a propane valve. So those were discounted. He never got anything high enough to trigger an actual leak. Should it make us suspicious of the equipment? Or? Um, that's hard to say. We have okay. uh, confirmed um, at each of the locations that we have done a repair so far that there is an actual leak uh -huh. with our equipment and with uh, with this theory, uh, with soap and right. you know, bubbles. Yeah. Um, so we are trying to confirm them along the way. If we come to a place where we cannot confirm a leak, um, and it is one of the lower level non-hazardous leaks, we'll, uh -huh. we'll reevaluate at the time. But so far, everywhere we've been, we have been able to find a leak. Okay. Is there a pattern of leaks that would indicate that there should be some preventative maintenance, like tight tightening or re-taping the threads or anything like that, that other than changing meters? Um, we uh, changing changing the meters and repiping them uh, at the same time is the most effective way to take care of that sort of preventative maintenance. Um, the you you can't tighten a piece of the meter assembly without loosening another. So it's not something we recommend that we just go out and try to tighten things up. Um, so the reason we do this periodically is so that we catch the small leaks when they're small and can redo the piping so that it, it does not leak. How much is there an average cost for these, like a grade two fix that you've been seeing? Uh, that's something we'll calculate. We're, we're tracking our time on this, um, but basically, it's staff labor, mostly. Um, the parts, since, like Eric mentioned, we're going to be changing those out anyway, um, is not a significant increase, although it may impact us more this fiscal year. Um, but it's going to be staff time for fixing these, and we're experiencing two to four hours a meter um, t to fix these. So it is going to be a lot more propane labor than we see in other years. Um, we have, we generally run at a, we, we generally don't spend as much money in propane as is budgeted. Um, so the fact that we're going to spend two months working in propane, uh, it will probably flush out at the end. Uh, you know, I just know when I did uh, a remodel on our house in 2009 and 2010, the contractor detected a lot of internal leaks. And uh, so they spent several days running around um, taking walls apart. And I asked if that was uncommon, and they said it's very common. Right. And this, that was a question we got from quite a few people is, does this take care of my house itself, the internal? And we did tell people that, no. no, it only goes up to the wall of your house. Uh, anything inside would be a, it's not a covered utility. It, it would be a plumber or a secondary service. So. so one of the questions, at the level two, can you, can you detect the odor if you're near it? It depends. On some of the higher level twos, yes, at times. Um, the, the issue with a lot of these is they're right next to the meter and regulator assembly and the regulator vents normally. So whether or not 
you smell it all the time might be an indicator. Um, but a lot of the level twos are pretty low level and you know, not, not very noticeable. Any other questions or comments on this? Thank you for that update. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. We now move on to item 8F, which is wildfire mitigation plan. Randy again. Sir. Um, in September of 2016, Senate Bill 1028 passed. Um, and what this is is catastrophic wildfire legislation. Um, it requires that each electric utility, publicly owned electric utility, minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfire posed by our electrical equipment. And a specific requirement of this bill is that the board of each utility determine whether a portion of the of our operational area is at a risk of catastrophic wildfire and then develop wildfire mitigation measures if so. Um, so what we have here before you is the information in your packet, the information that our staff has reviewed uh, to make this determination. Um, we reviewed historic fire data, local conditions, and uh, the 2016 Amador Fire Safe Council Protection Plan. Uh, and all of those are in your packet. Um, and we, as staff, has determined that the area of our overhead line in Amador County between Salt Springs Reservoir and Lower Bear River Reservoir may have a significant risk of catastrophic wildfire due to our overhead facilities. Um, we do have several advantages here when we are talking about mitigation measures. Our infrastructure in that area is very new. We have um, relays that open very quickly uh, in case of an, an incident where something falls on the line. Um, but we as staff are working on um, mitigation measures uh, to bring back before the board. Uh, in your packet, we have a resolution uh, to this effect. Basically says, we have overhead electrical lines in a high fire risk area um, to comply with Senate Bill 1028. Uh, we have determined that our facilities may have a significant risk of catastrophic wildfire associated with them um, and that the Board of Directors directs our staff to create a plan to come up with these mitigation measures. Um, so that is Resolution 1810. Uh, staff is requesting that the board approve that. Uh, and we did talk about this in planning as well. Yeah, the planning committee talked about this. Um, clearly there is a, a risk there. And so to comply with the state law, we need to um, recognize that and pass a resolution and indicate that we will develop a mitigation plan. A lot of our discussion was around that mitigation plan and coming to the understanding that we already do it. Um, we have a plan with the United States Forest Service already. And so a lot of the mitigation plan required by this will be a reflection of what we already do in the plan from the United States Forest Service. I do have one question um, that came up after our planning committee. And that is I was reading an article about PG&E and the recent legislation. Um, and the article kept referring to state standards for utilities, electric line utilities through forested areas and so on. I mean, what are the states? I mean, do we know it's states? Are there truly state standards? Is there a set of standards that says, I don't know what it is, you know, trees can be no closer to lines than X or the relays have to open no slower than Y or... I mean, what are these standards that, that I read about in the newspapers? Um, and I don't have a specific list of those standards. Um, I know that there are, depending on the uh, voltage of your power lines, certain corridor widths that are required in forest, uh, U.S. Forest Service areas, um, because that came up during the, um, the Out Valley build because the PG&E line that existed there before had a much right. narrower corridor. Um, as far as what, where this list resides, I don't know, but I can certainly find well, it. Well, I mean, the reason I bring this up is because since the Napa fires, I mean, I've learned, I, which I didn't realize, 
that um, utility is liable for monetary damages even if it has um, followed standards or done everything they should do. I just don't think I've ever seen a list of what we should do, and I'd like to be comfortable that we are doing. I mean, I'm sure we are, but I just don't know what those things are. And if there's anything that we're not, it'd be nice to catch it as part of this exercise. Okay. We will take a look at that. Thank you. So I have two questions on this one. Is just looking at, uh, at Senate Bill 1028, mm -hmm. it says it's an annual compliance. So I assume we're going to put in a process to do this annually. Um, the other thing is, since this is, uh, since we have a joint poll agreement with PG&E, is there a way to check whether w our proposal matches theirs or is, differs from them? Because we, we effectively should be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. We'll reach out to them and see what they're doing. So far, only one public utility has filed their wild, uh, wildfire mitigation plan. That's the city of Anaheim. That's the only one to date. Um, we're working with other districts. They, uh, Plumas reached out to us. Truckee Donner reached out to us. Um, so we'll be working with them. We'll also be investigating joining the California Munis Municipal Utilities Association, which really has lobbyists and is what most of the other public utilities that provide electric belong okay. to, and we don't. So we're going to be looking at that as and well. And so we would do that instead of the Northern California Power Authority? Just yeah. Right? I think we're not members of Northern California Yeah, Power I know, Authority. but yeah. those are kind of the two choices. Right. It seems like most of the public utilities are working with CMUA, uh -huh. whereas the privates, I think, are more, you know, like the geysers and those okay. are probably more the NCPA. And just to reinforce, this law only applies to overhead power lines. So if the, if the substation <laughs> caused a spark that was a fire, that, that's not covered under this this specific requirement. Right. Carolyn? Since it's, our line is fairly new and was engineered at great expense, wouldn't we expect that those standards, such as how fast the relay opened or how far away the trees were, were, were covered in our design engineering? I, I, yeah, I would think so. I mean, I know. I mean, the standards that I was always hearing were PG&E standards. So the question is, are the PG&E standards the same as the state standards, or are they different in some way? Well, did our engineer follow them? And I mean, it's kind of at, after the, the horse has left the barn now, but I would hope <coughs> that yeah. our engineer followed some kind yeah, of Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as concerned about the design of the, of the thing as of, the, of, maintenance. Of the maintenance and um, what goes on around the line, so like in that corridor. I mean, I just want to be sure that we are at minimum following standards, and then in addition to that, That's assessing risk on our own and, and saying we should do even a little bit more because that tree looks like it's dying and leaning or whatever. Well, I think the other thing is since we've had two trees fall on the lines in the three years, that's at least a clue that the corridor that we thought would. And then there's this tension, as you know, between the Forest Service and us. I mean, I think we'd like the corridor to be air on the side of being wider. And, and they're in the business of keeping the trees standing. Right. And so in that tension, maybe we, now that two have fallen down, maybe it needs to be pushed out a little bit more. We do annually inspect the corridor with a registered professional forester who makes recommendations. And to date, the Forest Service has not rejected any of the trees we've identified that needed to be felled. In fact, they've given us a opportunity to fell more that they've identified. So right now they've been very accommodating. Sean McGinnis at U.S. Forest Service Silver, uh, Silver Ranger Station has been very accommodating. So, oh, that's great. Yeah, and we have a good relationship with them, and they're very, very accommodating. We need to add a tree we didn't catch before. I sent him an email, and he gives me approval within a day. So it's been actually pretty helpful. Okay, good. So, so yeah, so let's uh, we move on to resolution number 1810. Um, Don't we have to come up with a plan before we... No, no, this resolution is just recognizing through our action that we have a utility or electric line in an area of potentially severe hazard area for wildfire. 
So that what follows that is the mitigation plan. But this is just recognizing that we have that, or is acknowledging that we have that. Time limit on developing the plan. Is there a time limit on developing the plan? No, and that's what we're working with CMUA on as well. They're um, pushing back against the CPUC um, that they don't have sufficient regular or sufficient regular. Re they haven't adopted through administrative law process their policies yet they're pushing this down so this is the first step we have to acknowledge or that we are or are not in there then we go to the wildfire mitigation plan and so we're like i said only one utility has done it so far in that city of anaheim and um, but like i said i mean what staff says and what i believe is we're already doing everything we should we believe we should be doing so yeah. this is okay. more of a paper paper exercise uh, well the statute calls for criminal liability yeah so, so therefore, I, I, I don't want to call it an exercise. <laughs> so let's call. Let's go to resolution number eighteen. <laughs> that context understood. Yeah. Um, do I have a motion to adopt resolution number I move eighteen? I move we adopt 10. the resolution. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> okay, and now we go on to. Um, Item 8G, which is the PG&E Interconnection Agreement and Transfer Facilities Agreement, an update on Amendment Number 1. Eric. This has uh, been a long time coming. Um, <laughs> since 2014, um, this issue's been known and work, worked on, especially by uh, Directors uh, O'Grady and Epstein. They've worked on this a lot, and I've been involved in the last year. Um, basically, we analyze the options we had for compliance with the interconnection agreement and the transfer facilities agreement. Um, those options were to build a switch station, we could default on the agreement, or we could negotiate a resolution with PG&E, which is what we did. Um, this outlines the steps that we've gone through, and um, the amendment has been signed um, by both parties and has been submitted to FERC. And uh, we will be financing this with USDA monies, our, oper our reserves, um, and a loan from Bank of the West possibly as well. So probably best just to open up to any questions. Of course, Carolyn's the only one left now. <laughs> so, you, so you're on the spot. I'm asking. You got any questions, Carolyn? <laughs> well, Terry might have questions. I, I think it would be helpful to just say the major thing, major change. So... The major change we've done is we're deeding back the 110, the high, the high voltage overhead line to PG&E, and we're paying a one-time payment that covers all maintenance on everything they do in perpetuity, or 45 years, I think, it, it, whichever comes first, um, at, for a fixed amount. That fixed amount over time is less than what we would have paid otherwise, and we eliminate any risk of, of building uh, this this thing that we for which the cost we we don't know for sure what the cost would be the reason why we didn't think of this four years ago <laughs> is we wanted to try everything we could to see if there's some other method um, and didn't come across it uh, but the other thing is uh, we didn't have the cash at that time so at this point we have the cash to do it with with a manageable risk we'd like to have more reserves than otherwise, and it lets us hold rates relatively flat for a couple of years and then start to lower them again. So it's a good outcome and it reduces our exposure on overhead lines mm -hmm. uh, and, and the maintenance of that. So that's the, that's the essence of it. The borrowing comes from RUS and we're borrowing against equipment that we had paid cash for. So we had some borrowing capacity left over to cover it and the rest of it comes from the cash reserve we've built up over the last couple of years. Is this going to raise the rates again? Or no, that's what I said. The, this is the cheapest of the, the options to satisfy. We can no longer, we were looking at a plan of lowering rates a penny a year, and instead we're just going to hold them constant for a couple of years. If the winners are good, we'll be in a position to reevaluate and then start to drop them well, constant again. Plus DPI. Plus constant CPI. plus, yeah. So we can afford this now, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, and this is the and most the affordable of the options. And the alternative was pretty... Uh, Onerous. Yes, unaffordable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. These were daunting. Daunting. Yeah, my only... When I was reading the staff report, I mean, I was just putting myself in the shoes of a casual reader. Now, I don't know if anybody else will read this, 
or not. I read it. I mean, there are people <laughs> other than the board. <laughs> um, but I mean, a casual reader, someone just thumbing through the board packet, just seeing what's going on and so on. And the first paragraph, again, to the casual reader, not understanding all the history and context, might think that we did something wrong. <coughs> and that is not the case. I mean, because it did not comply? Yeah, because it says did not comply with the handbook as constructed. I mean, so somebody may say, well, yeah. what are these people screwing up? You know, but that wasn't the case. Right. All of the construction complied. The original agreement assumed that we would be deeding the line back to them. Right. What we didn't want to do was bear all the costs of that, and so we kept looking for alternatives. And it was like a roller coaster. Sometimes we thought we had a good one, and then we didn't, then we did, then we didn't. It all depended... Yeah. on who in PG&E made the decision. And that's what's led us to this. But we did nothing wrong. In fact, <coughs> I we did everything right. And in particular, we did things right for the community to um, manage the costs as best as we could. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to, uh, again, I don't know if anybody else would read that, but I just wanted to make that statement um, yeah, to if clarify. The, if the second sentence said, uh, you know, we were surprised late in the process to be notified that PG&E discovered that the design, as approved by them and us, did not comply with one of their procedures. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what actually. Yeah. That's that's a truthful statement. Yes. Yeah. Just call it bait and switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I don't know that that's. Well, it's also. <laughs> I don't know that that's what happened. It's well, it's also the handbook, which talks about the distance from the safety protection gear and the point of interconnection says it's generally and usually within 200 feet or whatever the distance is, meaning that there was plenty of latitude that PG&E had to say that what we did was okay. And in fact, at lower levels of management, they did say it was okay. It was at the upper level of management that they said it was not okay. So, okay. You know, I, I'd say um, it's a lot of money for sure. Um, I personally am glad to have PG&E out of our hair, meaning I'm glad to be out of the O&M, and I'm kind of happy that, you know, our end of responsibility is at the substation as opposed to yeah. that overhead line that goes down that daunting slope and that we don't have to get involved with Salt Springs Reservoir. So, again, it's a lot of money, and there was a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, PG&E did uh, give us some more leeway than maybe they had to, for sure. Uh, and I'm glad to have them out of our hair. So this was just information and updates? This is strictly informational, yeah. We, the board had approved this, and we reported out in a prior closed session that okay. we were going to. Are you going to discuss at this point the timing for the cash coming in too? I was going to do it on my GM report. Oh, okay, I can do it now. Um, it's it's germane to the discussion. It, it, yeah, it is the last. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, relative to our funding, there's two aspects. One, there's the USDA funding, and then there's the Bank of the West funding. So I'll just talk about USDA first. So the USDA funding, um, in fact, I'll be requesting We've already noticed it, and hopefully the board's amenable to a special meeting um, tomorrow at 8 a.m. for our board to meet to adopt a resolution relative to the C8 loan. It's been reviewed. Basically, there were 34 emails <coughs> Friday late afternoon between the Office of General Counsel in Washington, D.C., our attorney, and our consultant, Howard Barnes. And so we want to get this adopted before the close of their year, which is September, end of September. So we want to get this done. ASAP. Otherwise, he said we'd have to hold it out till November, and we don't want to do that. So, um, this once this part is adopted, we've already been guaranteed the funds of 3.765 million dollars for sunk costs on the Out Valley project that we paid cash for. So it's just going against that project. Um, in the interim, um, anticipating we will, that USDA might be a little slow, we've worked with the uh, NRCFC, um, which is a financing arm, a fi private financing corporation but that deals with this sort of issue to give us a um, short-term loan uh, at terms almost identical to the USDA terms. And we've been that's been approved. 
we received a notification that we are good to go with CFC, we can have that. So basically there'll be no, we have to pay by October 25th. That will be possible with the CFC bridge loan. And then we'll just pay that back. There's no prepayment penalty. We'll pay that back as soon as USDA loan funds. So that's the USDA. Any questions on that aspect of it, where we are? So Eric, you're going to include the, there's a resolution that's part of that CFC loan. Can that get taken care of then tomorrow as well? As part of the yeah, we can do the that. Same resolution. No, it's different. It's different. Oh, it's a different resolution. So it'd be a second item on second bullet item on that okay. agenda. So work with Kelly and get that. We'll get that on there. Yeah, we'll okay. get that on there as well. Can I back up just a minute so that I have in my head? If somebody asked me, sure. we spent millions to build that 115 line, and now we have to pay to give it away. That's correct. Yeah. No, this is. How do I explain that to people who haven't? I sort of remember the issue, but. Right, it's, it, what it is is um, the, the, the next 35 years maintenance, the extended maintenance, we're paying for it up front. Otherwise, we would have had to pay for it as, as we go. So that, that's what we're paying for is, the ma is maintenance. We're giving it to them and then we're paying to maintain it? We're paying them to maintain it. Otherwise, we would have had to maintain it ourselves. I mean, their rates are higher. Okay. But... But uh, we're paying, we're, we're taking everything that, that they operate, that we use, you know, that's part of our service, we're paying a one-time payment to cover the maintenance for the life of that use. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And there's a, a tax in there as well, the ITCC tax. We have to pay for that, that's a portion of it too, in addition to the one time maintenance. It's that portion and then the yeah, tax portion. Federal, because they're getting a federal tax. tax. Set, and so we have to pay the capital gains. The capital gains. Well, it's, yeah. capital, yeah, it's, it's yeah. essentially. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> um, with regards to the Bank of the West, that has become the can of worms that has been opened is enormous. Um, we found that our wastewater plant straddles two parcels. Why? No idea. Um, I even tried to go in the memory banks of Everything Gary Gary Dirk. Yeah, I tried to go back to the memory banks of Gary Dirk and Nate Whaley to see how the original parcel map was done, why this wastewater plant was on two parcels. They didn't know. And in fact, the surveyor that we hired, who's a professional land surveyor, couldn't find the documents that figured out how all that happened. It's Kirkwood. Um, as I'm learning. So the Bank of the West basically threw up um, a red flag that they wanted additional documents and additional work to provide a refinancing on essentially the employee <laughs> Lava Rock, which has nothing to do with that because that's on the parcel. They're talking about a brownfield category one survey they want done, which is complete overkill. So we've pushed back pretty hard relative to that. Um, explained all the sunk costs we now have as a result of them not knowing what they want and why wasn't this a problem before. Um, we'll be having a meeting with them soon, but they're, they've already extended the olive branch to maybe we can help you share some of the costs that you've incurred. And so we're working on that and we'll see how that goes. Um, if, it's not, if it's not resolved to our satisfaction, staff will probably be recommending we, we change banks at this point. And if we don't get the refinancing loan, we, it would only drop us to around one five in December if we used operating cash instead of the four hundred eleven thousand dollars we were anticipating. So instead of two million in December, which is our low low, we dropped to one point five, which is still above the threshold we used for analysis of one million was our really bottom line we ever wanted to see. So we have contingency upon contingency plan, and we're working through that now. So that's where that's where the Bank of the West sits. Any questions on that? When do you expect to get the USDA loan? What date? That, according to Howard, once this resolution is passed, his thought is two months. So that would be November. But we have the CFC in the interim. And that's a done deal? We just have to pass the resolution. It is a done deal. Should we get a lot line adjustment? Yes. But I don't want to. I don't want to show all my cards. I, I have a plan to, to facilitate that. <laughs> it is really normal here. I mean, the Meadows is built on four parcels. <laughs> you know, and I own a property.
property in two counties, but two, uh, <laughs> that, that, is, that is two parcels in two counties. Just because the surveying was never done very well? Correct. I don't think anyone followed the surveys. The they didn't follow the surveys, or they didn't have access to them, and there was no civil engineering of in most of the buildings early on at all. Yeah, the, the land surveyor that we retained uh, from Loomis and Associates out of, uh, they have office in South Lake Tahoe and they also have offices in uh, Carson City and Reno. Speaking with him, um, he speaks my language and basically translated, this is pretty normal for Kirkwood. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, the KCA club was built on about four parts. <laughs> yeah. It's just the way it was done here. And, and remember, there was no county department to handle any of this either in those days, back when a lot of this was done. Yeah. Just, the county and the, didn't have the park anything. is on, I think, three parcels yeah. that, that we maintain. And anyway, that's another issue we have to resolve soon, too. Okay. So. All right. OK. Um, let's move on to item H, which is the 2019 Summer Festival fundraising goal. Uh, so we actually discussed this uh, quite a bit at planning as well, and I think it was the consensus of planning that to go with the recommendation that everything, assume everything's the same and up the target to 30,000. As calculated. As, as yeah, as calculated, as we've yeah. calculated the last four years. But there was an important discussion on this. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the planning committee asked um, Eric and Rick to do was to convene uh, the Summer Festival Committee no later than, say, November, rather than waiting till January or February. Basically, and, and Jess was an important part of this conversation, she said basically that planning the Summer Festival is really like planning two events. One is the festival with the beer and wine and food and so on, and the other is the silent auction. There are two big efforts. And essentially, the silent auction absolutely requires volunteers. And over the last several years, it's been the same core group of volunteers each year, which we just, you know, that's not sustainable. We can't depend on that. So the recommendation is that um, a committee be convened and have, at that initial meeting, representatives from all the major Kirkwood entities, such as, uh, well, of course, KMPUD, um, Vail from whatever EPIC group. We learned that there are actually three EPIC groups now um, within Vail. Uh, that's relevant. Uh, KPS, KCA, the HOA President's Council, and there are probably others, to discuss how volunteers can be uh, gained to plan and manage the silent auction portion of the festival. Um, and so Jess said that she can organize the festival logistics, the administration, the tickets, the food, the beverages, beverages, all those things, but needs others to organize the silent auction. So that's where we are. We're going to assume that we're successful in, f in finding the necessary volunteers for this coming year, but hopefully successful beyond that developing a sustainable model. And for example, one idea, I think it was Carolyn's idea, where, for example, one year it might be sponsored by KCA, and the next year it might be sponsored by Vail, and the next year it might be sponsored by the HOA President's Council, or something like that, some rotational thing, uh, and maybe even have them compete against each other year to year <laughs> about how much can be raised. But anyway, that's, that was the substance of our discussion at the Planning Committee. But we do recommend that we stay the course right now, assuming we'll be successful for next year with a $30,000 target. I think that's a good outcome. And thanks for taking it. Yeah. Carol? I haven't had a thought in the last couple days, particularly after yesterday. I, I have a friend in the Meadows who owns in the Meadows who's a retired physician. The last time she was up here, she went hiking two days with her family, and on both days ended up taking care of somebody ill on the trail rather than hiking with her family. And I'm thinking that the fire, you, look, you think fire department, you think burning buildings and people with hoses, and that's what we see around 
and, and yet we really have almost none of that happened. I can almost count on one hand the flat structure fires we've had, certainly on two hands in 30 years. And I'm thinking that somehow we need to educate and emphasize the medical aspect of the fire department response and that perhaps we could get more volunteers with the older people, people who bring their pair, older parents, even people with small children, and remind them that most of the year the fire department is, is the first responder for medical here. And I think we need to somehow put that a little more in the forefront of people's minds than we've been buying SCBAs and you know, infrared cameras, things that for structure fire, and I realize the gurney was medical, but I don't think people really understand that how much of it is medical response. Well, I think that ties in nicely to the, the uh, funds we need to raise to um, balance out the budget for the fire department right. because yeah, it is will be it will all be aimed at that that half of the uh, department services, the emergency medical services, the services out on the highway, not having to do with hoses and trucks and so on. Right. So, so I, I think that your idea ties in nicely. I don't know how exactly effort. to do it without getting. Yeah you know, macabre about it, but, you know, we're all subject in our ages, not you maybe, but <laughs> the rest of us, to possible heart attack or stroke. It's just the beard that makes them look young. It, you know, increased <laughs> altitude sickness, these things that, and then you think, I used to hike alone where there's no cell service, and now I'm sort of afraid to do that. Um, I think we somehow need to point some of this out to try to lock in more volunteers. Yeah. I think, yeah, and we talked about this yesterday yeah. with the, the chili cook-off, and I thought it was a great idea. And I'm going to be talking with Rick a little bit and Jess and talk maybe some newsletter articles too, to preemptively just maybe identify what we do. I mean, we, we identify the calls and where we go, but, you know, and, and our reports, but maybe just make it a little more user-friendly and is a newsletter article of what we do. So well, we're, we're going to be working on that. the question of the name. I mean, should it be the Kirkwood First Responder Association that also does fire? Or go back, we're not fire and rescue anymore, right? Or are we? What do we call them? Kirkwood Volunteer Fire Department? I mean, for a while it was fire and rescue. For, for a number of years it was called fire and rescue. Maybe we should reconsider. Or fire and emergency services. Yeah. That first I mean, we don't need to fine tune it here, but I think first responder. People know what it means. And they want to have one. <laughs> That's a good idea. And as, as you said, there's no ambulance. So it, I, I suspect that a lot of people, especially guests coming up here, just have no clue that right. they can't just call 911 and get immediately within five minutes taken to an ER. Because yeah. that's what they expect. Yeah. And so, so that's, yeah. anyway, my thoughts. The, I mean, the, near, the nearest ambulances on the east side is South Lake Unit. That's number seven, right? Myers. Myers. And then on this side, it's Pioneer. So it's 45 minutes this way and 45, maybe 50 minutes that way. Yeah. So those are the two nearest ambulances that we, we can call upon. So um, I guess what we need is a motion to adopt $30,000 as the fundraising goal for the 2019 Summer Festival. Okay. So moved. So second. Seconded by Standish. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now we move on to um, general manager report. Um, well, we, I, we, we kind of covered everything except for the last one, so I'll just skip right to the wastewater blockage and spill into the board's aware um, that we did have a blockage uh, that in the collection line that consisted of diapers, um, feminine hygiene products, and uh, diaper wipes, wet wipes. Um, and you can see in the picture, um, when we arrived, a uh, homeowner notified us of this issue. Um, we went down immediately and looked at it. Um, it was leaking about a quarter to a half gallon a minute out there. It basically had filled and just started. We spilled about 400 gallons of uh, wastewater. Uh, fortunately, it was all uh, effluent. There were no solids that were discharged. We got to it in time. Uh, we actually used our... Um, uh, 
I call it a suck vac, but it's a, her, her vacuum trailer that we normally use for uh, potholing in delicate situations, but we use that. It has a you know, 500 gallon capacity. We use that to remove the liquid so we would discontinue spilling into the meadow. Um, thanks, uh, everybody showed up. It was a great effort, but particularly um, special thanks to Joe Pellerin and uh, Spencer uh, Patterson. They uh, utilized some old rusty things that people had kind of forgotten we had, and they were actually able to, for lack of a better word, plunge the uh, blockage and then um, catch the debris at the lower lift so it didn't go anywhere else in the system. And it saved us. It would have cost us $3,500, similar to what happened on Fremont Dangberg uh, earlier this year, late last year. Um, so it was a good effort by everyone. Um, and so that's, that's where that stands. So we... Uh, our, I've uh, directed the supervisor to have someone go and inspect, I'll pop the lids on all the manholes and look in there and see if there's any backup anywhere. Just do a walker once around the entire system and see if we can identify anything like this that might be building up that we may not see because we're in a low usage time. Um, and this manhole basically caught all of KMA except for hawkweed. It was, that's where the flow was. So low usage. Peter, you got to use more water. I don't know. So we identify these quicker. But... Um, and so that, that basically we're going to be looking into that as well, um, trying to do a little more pre pre preventative work on that now that we've uh, restaffed up to the right levels in water wastewater, we have staff available to work on that. So. Any questions on the spill? Oh, I can go back. That was this. That was. Uh, let's see who's that? That's uh, Spencer working. Oh, that's Spencer working the um, vacuum trailer, uh, sucking out the uh, wastewater. And then ultimately what we did, we took it, took that, put it into the wastewater treatment plant, and then we uh, chlorinated heavily the um, vacuum trailer and then discharged it through the uh, upper manhole that had started the backup as a way to just to make sure we got everything flushed out. And it also uh, dissipated the chlorine before it got to the plant so it didn't kill our bugs there. I think it's important to mention that none of that get it, got into any of the creek flows. No, no, no. It's, yeah. This time of year, it, it barely it made it the to the edge of the trail, yeah. edge of the walking trail, so it definitely right. didn't get anywhere near the creek. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We'll go on to operations report, Rick. Um, as you know, we had our 38th annual Kirkwood Children's Fun Run, 5K and 10K event. And I was surprised. We actually had 103 runners this year total, wow. including the kids. Um, if you were out there, it felt like, oh, gosh, we were under numbers. There was only 50 or 60, but there was more. We had 29 uh, runners in the 10K with the uh, best time by Jeremy Gifford, uh, 50 minute. Jamie. Is it Jamie? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you. Do you know Jamie? I, I just happened to know the one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I uh, 50 minutes and 42 seconds for that run, outstanding. For the 5K, there was 56 runners. Alan Ebers, do you know him? Nope. Um, 24 <laughs> minutes and 33 seconds. And uh, Connor, Eric's son, actually came in fourth. He was a minute and 30 seconds behind third place, which was pretty outstanding. And he had a football game the night before, so. Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for kids, uh, Brandon Porter, I think it's a homeowner's son. Uh, there were 18 runners um, for the kids, so Brandon Porter won that. Special thanks to Jessica and Kathy for, for organizing the event, getting all the, uh, the sign-ups done through Ultra Sign Up. How many, how many people signed up before the event, and how many showed up to sign up Only day of? 20 people registered before the event. So the rest of the, whatever that is, 70 plus. We got registered, logged into the timing software all within 45 minutes, and the race started, what, two minutes late? Yeah, and that was yeah, because I was, was walking back from the fire truck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it went really smoothly yesterday morning, with a little bit of, you know, frantic, ah, you know, <laughs> but it went great. Well, outstanding work, and I thank you. I think everybody had a good time. Um, we had one renegade 82-year-old runner with tie-dye shorts. He didn't pay for it, but he was out there supporting the event. He's apparently notorious for it. He does this in races all around Tahoe where he just jumps in and runs. 
but he caused a lot of confusion. Yeah. And we were stressed out that there was somebody still up on the course. But all, according to our software, everybody was back in. But we kept hearing on the radio there was somebody up there. But we figured it out, and he got back down. <laughs> so I hope I'm out there when I'm 82 running Me too. Um, and then also thanks to Ken Castrico. He was part of Tahoe Mountain Milers once upon a time, um, supporting this event. And over the years, he's now just volunteering completely, driving from incline with all the equipment and uh, really a great asset, so uh, we look forward to next year's event as well. Uh, moving on, unless there's any questions about the 10K, um, staff has been hard at work uh, doing repairs at the East Lift. As you know, we've had flood damage there in the past, and so this is a picture of uh, what we've done in the last winter to, to mitigate the possible chance of water coming down the road and actually flooding this East Lift facility. If you're out there this week, you'll notice that we actually uh, created foundations and poured a uh, retaining wall around it to protect the east lift. And um, in the next week or so, we'll be pulling back the forms and completing that project. Uh, Brandy staff's been working hard, of course, with the propane survey results. Um, 12 inches above grid. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a two foot total depth. Um, so. Is there a certain volume you're able to contain compared to the lift? This is capacity basically this is basically diverting. This is this is diverting weight, uh, stormwater around. It has nothing to do with the okay. wastewater. And it's open ended. You can't quite well, maybe see that picture at the very end, where the big rock is. It's open ended. It's three sided. Oh, wall. I see what you're saying. So basically, it's moving the stormwater around, so it's not getting into. It's my not a containment basin for no, 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 If it would work, if it was a secondary containment, we'd have issues with. That, like our transformer pads, filling up with water, and we'd have to deal with trying to get that water out and not okay. playing. Or, yeah. So, it really, it's a good design, and uh, staff worked it hard. hard Mainly, we can't control the stormwater running on to this because it's coming out of a homeowner association, their stormwater where it's running. So, okay. uh, this basically, um, if you listen to uh, Greg McManus over the last few years, he's really been hard, hard to work trying to get something done here, and he and I talked, and this is the solution I came up with, and he thought it sounded pretty good. So, unfortunately, he's a burning man. Maybe he's done now, but I'll be happy to share it. We'll share some pictures with him. <laughs> uh, so, again, staff, a special thanks to Joe Peller, and he really led the charge on this, and attention to detail on uh, finishing it out. Did a nice job. Our next huge project, which we're real excited about, is the collection system. I only have one picture here. Um, but basically, looking at the manholes and putting these uh, lockable manholes down to keep water from coming up and out. Um, we'll be working in the meadow the next several weeks and uh, look forward to completing this project during the driest time. This is what will mitigate the iodine. Yes, th this is part of it. We're also lining the manholes as well, um, where it would be a, applying a epoxy augmented um, mortar, for lack of a better phrase. Um, we'll, also, we'll be plugging the holes, first of all, with the two-part epoxy, the big leaks. Mm -hmm. Then we'll be applying uh, basically a skim coat up to about, we can apply up to three inch thick. I think we're going to do about inch and a half to two inch, depending on the leaks we're seeing inside the manhole. And then we'll be replacing the frame and that what you're seeing there is the frame and lid will be replacing all the frame and lids and then we'll be pouring a concrete collar around the frame and lids and then um, mounting and how, the earth. How many manholes will be done before? Well is what we're going to do. And this uh, is instead all, of the flying saucers that we had talked about in the past? The flying saucers don't help. So it, it is. Be, yeah, yeah, it is be, yes. the, yeah those okay. those will be, yeah we can get rid of those now. <laughs> okay. Can they be used as sleds or if you've seen what's been in them, you probably would ask that question. But I'd be happy to sell them to you cheap. Okay. <laughs> it's got some great yeah. Um, I have a suggestion. You're going to have hikers and joggers ask whoever's out there what the hell they're doing. Do you, do you think you should prepare a statement that they would state or even a flyer? So that they're, they're, they've because been people directed, are going to say something. They've been directed to refer all inquiries to me okay. here. Yeah. Okay. And we'll also be caution taping everything off so no one should be crossing it without the proper PPE. But I know people are going to, somebody sure. will oh, get upset. Yeah. Because they won't know what's happening or why. Yeah. And that's why we put articles in the newsletter as well um, okay. about this. But I don't know what our readership is relative to who's out in the meadow. So. Right. But yeah, no, we've tried <laughs> to do everything we can, but we have a game plan. Okay. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, last thing is uh, our chipping program is continuing through uh, until the snow flies. And so we, just, just a friendly reminder, we go out on an as-needed basis. Um, and once we see a significant amount of piles out there, we'll, we'll usually spend the day doing the work. But it's been a good program so far. How many people, how many piles do you think we've chipped so far, Brandy? Your guesstimate. Mine's about 30. It might be more. But, uh, again, I think it's a worthwhile project that we do every summer and, um, and know that we'll pick it up uh, before the end of the season. Uh, there was some questions about what if there's material left behind and, or should we go out there with a loader and pick things up that aren't chipped. Um, and typically everybody plays very nicely. They give us material that we can use. And uh, I haven't had to reach out to anybody to say, hey, I can't grab this pile of whatever. So I think the public... Uh, the community understands the program, and so I uh, will continue. And that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to uh, the standing committee reports. Uh, finance? We haven't met since the last board meeting. Okay. Uh, planning met on Friday. We've covered most things, but there are two things that I want to bring up. The first is one of our, one of the goals, GM goals associated with planning has to do with should we offer to take on on a contract basis the um, removal of snow from drain inlets, storm drain inlets, uh, as an addition to a snow removal <coughs> contract. Um, the survey indicated that a certain amount of confusion about who's responsible for the storm drain systems. I know that in our East Meadows HOA meeting last July, there were certainly some misassumptions about uh, whose responsibility that is during the winter. So with the, what the planning committee recommended is recommends is that um, we really focus on just letting people know that it's the HOA's responsibilities. And if the HOAs start to request us, in other words, we will respond to uh, a desire for us to take it on, but given the recent history with the snow contracts and the costs and so on, and also comments in the survey about we take on too much, uh, our recommendation is that we don't pursue this until there is um, a vocal demand that we actually look into it. So, in other words, we're not asking, we're not going to ask staff to go put together potential scopes of work and costs and so on at this point because we just don't know that we should take it on. Good. This, um, the second thing um, oh, also <laughs> potentially, contra <laughs> potentially <laughs> controversial uh, really stems from the discussion we had last month when it came up, to, you know, came to the idea of the um, electric rates in, the, in April. Um, one of the, you know several of our goals have to do with economic development in the in the valley, and of course, any economic development in the valley really will involve the resort or the developer, as well as us. Um, it's now unclear to me what the sense of the community is, what the PUD's role should be. I mean, one of the things that Peter said in the last month was, why don't we just basically, this is not, not your words exactly, but stick to our knitting. We provide the utilities and people use them as they will. That implies that we don't have a role in economic development other than providing good utilities. On the other hand, um, we've been asked or we have talked about how can we stimulate more electric demand, um, how can we help with the parking situation, um, how do we help communication community-wide so that the community feels more cohesive? Um, and so the recommendation from the planning committee is that we put it on a, a future agenda, um, a review of our mission statement that can be clear about whether or not we have a role or what that role is when it comes to things other than simply providing the utilities, which is our main, our main job. So that was uh, the other substantive conversation we had. Is 
So I, I would just a ask um, Eric in his conversations with Jeff <coughs> in planning future board meetings about putting that on the agenda so we can have a discussion. Well, and just statement. to be specific, the mission yeah. statement's online. And by the way, Bob actually expressed, I said, Bob, can you remember exactly how you said this? <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> so the current Camp Beauty mission statement, to maintain and enhance the quality of life in Cork Road by providing our customers to safe, reliable, environmentally responsible services, and provide those services openly, efficiently, and cost-effectively. So that's our mission statement, and then we go into tactics at below that. So I would like to request that we agenda for the next meeting, a proposed change to the mission statement to be debated whether cost-effectiveness. Um, I don't know how you do cost-effective without accommodating a larger community. So if it's our job to accommodate the growth of the community is, what role do we play in making that growth easier? What's our, what's, what's the limits of what, what that's reasonable that we can spend our time doing or, n or not? Because, I mean, there are some people who think, not, not necessarily on the board, who think we should do nothing. We should just respond to what happens um, to the degree to which we can facilitate it. The only way to lower the rates significantly is to spread the cost across a larger user base. There aren't, there aren't any other options that are anything more than rounding errors. I think what Bob, I mean, Bob's words, I mean, I'll try to repeat Bob's words, which I thought were very good, which was that when we decided as a community to connect to the grid and take on that large cost, it was an investment in the future rather than sticking with just a diesel power plant, which is really an acknowledgement that at some point this community would die. And so we've invested in the future. Now we have to help make the future happen. <laughs> and that's with somehow growth. The question is, is, what's our role in promoting that growth? I would like to say, first of all, you might want to throw the word sustainable in there somewhere, because that's the, one of the big yep. words these days. Yep. Um, but being on the KCA board and being an HOA president, I, I think there is a lot of Urge, urging from the community, from these boards, to involve the various entities in, in some of these problems. The road, the drainage, parking, and certainly rates. But there are various entities that feel that not any one of these people, they'll, no one can take it on. And, and it's, there's too much overlapping responsibility, just for one thing, because of the parcel problem. If you look at the parcel maps and try to look at something like drainage, it, it, it's crazy. It, I mean, we've done it in the KCA. It's crazy. You can't. No one can take it on without some kind of cohesive community working on it. So I think there's a lot of people who support that it should be all the entities working on certain of these problems. Okay, those were the... Thank you, Carol. So those were... That's the planning committee. Uh, Personnel. Uh, several things to cover. Uh, so, first off, one of the things we've encouraged our new general man, Eric, to do is to look at staff training and also training for himself, in particular, any areas where he felt from his previous jobs did not adequately <laughs> prepare him. So, one of the things we've identified is a three week course in Utah that we highly were encouraging him to attend, he's willing to do, but we want to recognize the fact that three weeks is a long time to be away, but it's also an excellent way to train the other managers in this how to operate uh, independently. So we are, we are encouraging that to happen. It is in the budget, and we expect at this point that that will happen, but we don't want to cause any panic or <laughs> misinterpretation, so we wanted to mention that. What's the course called? Or it's what? the uh, University of Idaho Utility Executive course. And it's um, public and private utility executives, general managers, system general managers, uh, department managers from around. Actually, they had uh, the Thailand utility, uh, whatever they are, they come. I mean, it's world, people come worldwide, but we also reached out to um, some executives in California that have been here as references and talked to them. and. They were very pleased with the program and thought it was very worthwhile. Yeah. 
Um, and in that regard, so we're going to do a board training after the November meeting on communications. There's a one hour. And just Jessica, just. I think you took that yeah, already. You want to comment on it? Um, the nature of communication or something. The nature of, I'm forgetting the title of it. The critical but, nature um, of communication. Thank you. Um, it, it was very worthwhile. And I felt like it was directed kind of more towards board members than it was towards staff. Um, but it just talked about, you know, how communication can be problematic <laughs> and how to properly communicate and not be violating the Brown Act, things, things along those lines. I thought it was very worthwhile. So we'll do it together as uh, a web, as a structured thing for one hour at the end of the November board meeting, unless the powder conditions are so extreme. <laughs> and we have to postpone it until December. Um, and related to that, I mean, one of the things Eric has learned is by attending some of these conferences and meeting other people and similar things, a lot of ideas occur. And so we're going to encourage the board to attend some of these, look at some of these conferences and identify some of them that might make sense. Uh, the last thing we decided to do is the employee uh, handbook has been, has been edited and has, it's been going on for many years but doesn't represent a lot of things that are best practice currently. So rather than trying to edit that in, we've um, approved the idea that we'll take a, uh, a generic handbook that has all of the most recent things related to law and code and best practice, and then integrate into that uh, the specifics about Kirkwood. So that would mean that the next draft of the employee handbook, it's not going to be easy to track changes. I mean, almost everything will change, but we think a one-time upgrade of it is is the most efficient use of everybody's time. And I'll identify any major changes we're proposing. Since there won't be a track changes uh, functional, we'll identify anything that we're proposing that's a significant departure from what the current handbook says as a sort of modified track changes methodology. Uh, so that was everything in personnel. Uh, operations. I think one thing we didn't uh, discuss is uh, we're still waiting to get bids to repair the the roofs on the treatment plant, this building, and uh, employee housing. You want to add anything? Yeah, there? so we, the bids we received were not prevailing wage, and they have to be prevailing wage. So people were rebidding them, and we are, Brandy is nagging them once a week to get it, and uh, okay. with mixed results. But it is getting late this season, you know, so yeah. it could be problematic in IT. Um, so the IT committee spent a fair amount of time looking at the customer survey and identifying ways that we can increase communication flow. I'll just use that as a general thing. We came up with a number of strategies uh, that, that we want to pursue, That some of them we, we've talked about already. We also discussed adding Caltrans information to, uh, adding that option and then in, in, in integrating that into uh, things. And this would consist of as we get notifications, an easy way to post it on Facebook, a variety of social media, as well as send them out as email notifications for people who sign up, who sign up for that. Um, and th those are the major things we did. We did uh, adopt the, our first IT disaster recovery plan, so we have now identified every system, every aspect of it, who's responsible for what and what to do uh, in, the, in the event of issues uh, behind that. The, the other things we're doing is um, there's been some changes to the website to enhance the readability for people to have a visual impairment. You can make the fonts larger. You can make the contrast higher. So we're, we're, proceeding, we're proceeding with that. Uh, we also um, adopted a privacy policy that will be posted on the web, and then we're going to strengthen the password management uh, systems overall. The effect that would have on the board is we will ask you to change your passwords. Uh, <laughs> let no, me finish. No, hold on. Let me, you haven't even... I want you for 90 days, not 60. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saved the bad news for last. <laughs> I apologize. And that's everything for my team. Okay. Um, we go on to uh, temporary advisory committee reports, the fire funding. Um, of course, we we are not meeting at this point as a as a as a committee or as a temporary committee. Uh, however, we are waiting. Well, we're trying to go. We, we're the, our next step is to have a meeting between 
the officials of Alpine and the officials of Amador County and us all at the same time to discuss as a group the percentage of property taxes that will come back to us um, based on a new base year. And so that's the next step in our discussions uh, before we tackle the, the temporary tax, right? Before we, we, we what we've established is $90,000 is the goal starting in July of 2019. Okay, if there's nothing else on those, um, we'll go to the general discussion. Um, opportunity for board members to ask questions, clarifications, etc. If none... Uh, well, uh, there's only one other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, and that is uh, something that Standards notice, noticed, and, and these are these enterprise opportunity oh, yeah. zones. I don't necessarily have the right name for it, but in the, ta in the tax bill that was passed this year, it identifies, it sets up structures where, where if certain parties do investments for at least 10 years, they can get favorable tax treatment on existing investments. Uh, Kirkwood just happens to fall into one of those zones. So I think it may be worthwhile to see if there is a, assuming once the regulations come out, which is sometime this month, um, if we look at low-income housing and we take a broad view of it, not just the employee needs, but sort of make it broader, broader than that, increasing the full-time residents here, it might be more cost-effective to have that be privately financed and then rent it out on, a, on, a, on an agreement um, than for us to do it some other way. And so we think once the recs come out, we should take a look at that, do a little bit of brainstorming, and see if that isn't a substantially better way uh, to finance than uh, the, the other alternatives that we've pursued. I think there are other opportunities, too, for entities um, that wouldn't necessarily be PUD-related, but um, yeah, I think I, it's I definitely an economic development meeting topic yeah. that we definitely yeah. need to bring up because really the players will be there, the developer and available. Yeah, so maybe there. we could um, count. Yeah, maybe um, add that to the minute to to the agenda and try to get some preliminary information. I'm working on it uh, for in the Oakland area for artist housing, mm -hmm. so it overlaps another project that I have. So I might be able to figure some things okay. out for that. Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, 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 so our mission on. statement is on the next agenda. Is that what you request? I would, I would request that that be done, and it's up to the president. And then we have a, uh, um, what do we call it, economic development meeting in October? Is that right? Then it's it's the correct. Friday before. Friday, right. it's a normal Friday tax. should be the Friday before. Yeah, so when a, we, th we assume it's 1 o'clock. Yeah, if, it, I if it's. Remind Bill that they're hosting this time. Yeah, if, it, if tradition is upheld. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think there's an email in my box, inbox that I have not read regarding the... Okay. So We're hoping it's 1 o'clock so it doesn't conflict with any of the others. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, you know, just on that topic, I mean, it seems to me that almost everybody has invested in this place. It's, like you said, it's an alternative not to shutting down, right? Um, except Vail, which is sort of the white elephant in the room, right? I, I think it was mentioned at the last board meeting where I was not in attendance. Um, you know, we've, we've invested in the electricity line. Uh, Verizon, as we discussed at the IT, brought in LTE. Uh, Volcano ran fiber to the home. Caltrans finally repaved 88. And, you know, the, the entity that just has not invested anything in now six years, six and a half years is, is Vail. And I'm sure they would dispute that, but um, other than preventative maintenance, it's just nothing's happened. Okay, so um, we now move on to a closed session. We will be discussing two items. One, <coughs> significant exposure to litigation involving one potential case concerning CSAA versus Kirkwood. Carolyn, Medicine. thank you for having me. Beauty. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. And the second is closed session, uh, significant exposure to litigation involving one potential case concerning Casol versus uh, Kirkwood Meadows PUD. And then we'll come back to open session after the closed session. Are those related to the PUD? Yeah. 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 Y
Should I stay? Or not? You, you can't stay. It's a okay. closed session. Yeah. Okay. I'm just yeah. Asking. But yeah. One, one is related to. Well, that's why I wonder if you want me to stay. No, yeah, one's one's related to the Okay. Anything that gets reported out will end up. Yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> Are we convening to the conference room or staying? I think we can stay here if Drew can just shut everything down. Okay, the um, board met in closed sessions on the two items noted in the agenda, and the board took no actions. And um, this meeting is now adjourned.